And we had, in fact, in the episode with the Grey Sisters, this is interesting, no one knows that, well, it's interesting to me, I find it interesting. The episode with the Grey Sisters that happened where Jason goes and they tell him, you know, you and Medea are destined to be together, um, but, which is kind of what he already knows. That was so different. Originally, Hercules and Pythagoras weren't supposed to be in that scene. They were supposed to be walking through a forest and then suddenly, like, they're just, they're just separated by fog and Hercules and Pythagoras are miles away and Jason doesn't realise how he's so far ahead and he's sort of in a dreamlike state and we were going to shoot it at a lake that I think they used once in Merlin and the three sisters were just supposed to be appearing there in the water so you never knew how they got there, it was never going to be a cave and the episode was written differently and I can't remember why they changed it but it was never that they said, um, there is a point to this story, it was never that they said, oh, you are Medea, your destinies are tied, because Jason, you know, he kind of already knew that. What they were supposed to say when he said something about Ariadne, is they said, foolish boy, they said, you think that you can protect her, you think that, you know, you're destined to be together, but in the end, it's your love that kills Ariadne. You are her downfall, and there's nothing you can do to stop that happening. And Jason can't compute that, and he doesn't tell the guys, and then at the end of that episode, which was the cliffhanger just gone, Ariadne proposes to Jason, and he can't bring himself to say yes, um, because he knows that if he does say yes, ultimately that's what's going to destroy it. But then they changed it for lots of different reasons. The whole point I tell this story is we couldn't shoot on the lake or use any of the forest because Star Wars came in and booked the whole thing for three months. So we're like, damn, we need to fight. Let's go back in the cave. And that's why it was okay. <laughs> I shared this at the last Comic-Con I did. I don't know how much of a good idea that was. Um, yeah, for those of you that don't know, loads of pranks went on on set just to keep us entertained. And one early on this year was, I had a call from my agent asking me what my singing voice was like. I was like, why? They said, well, the producers from Atlantis have been in touch and asked. I went, really? And then Rob had the same call. I was sat next to him and his agent emailed him saying, Rob, what's your singing voice like? So he freaked out as well. I then went up to the producer who was on set, said, do you, do you need us to sing? He said, listen, it's nothing for you to worry about. Okay, it's fine. We just, it's an idea for a future episode. So then I got asked by the production coordinator, can I sing? Then they said, we're going to put you in contact with a singing teacher. I then got emailed by a proper singing teacher, I googled her, she has a website and everything in London, she was like, hi Jack, listen, I've got to work with all three of you boys, but apparently you're the main one, um, I don't know anything about the episode, but do you think you could meet me in London and we could go through some lessons? Then she said, actually, I don't have time in London and I hear you're going to Morocco, can you just send me a video of you singing eight bars of music, just so I can get an idea of what your voice sounds like? Unbeknownst to me, this, the whole thing was Mark and Rob's idea. They'd set up a fake email address, fake website, they'd got the producers in, they'd got their agents in, my, they'd called my agent and said, we need you to phone down. This is because they don't have enough to do on set. So everyone was aware of it, knowing that how terrified I am of singing. And I was like, oh man. And I thought it might be for like a wedding episode if I was going to get married, I, I didn't know what it was. And the only thing that gave it away, because I was getting really scared, was I was in Tesco's one evening after we finished filming with my headphones in, listening to music, slightly singing under my breath, practicing. And Rob came in, tapped me on the shoulder, went, oh, sorry, you made me jump. And he went, what were you just doing? I went, oh, I've got to sing this song. I'm trying to think of something. And he went, what were you singing? I was like, I was singing Ronan Keating when you say nothing at all. <laughs> and his little face, he went like this. He went, ah, oh, that's really good, man, yeah. Do you want me to help? I'd be more than happy to help you. And I was like, hold on, sir. Like, He's way too happy about this. And that's when I thought, right, this might be a joke. I wasn't 100% though. And then when I was in the next day filming, everyone kept saying, have you done that video? Have you done that video? Putting so much pressure on me. I thought, why are we having to rush this? We've not, not even got back from Morocco yet. So I went, yeah, yeah, I'll go do it. And then I went into a room that's hidden behind one of the sets. And I was trying to think what funny song I could sing. And I couldn't think of anything, so in the end, I just took off all my clothes, <laughs> borrowed a Hoover off the cleaner, who was mortified when he found out what I did with it. <laughs> and um, yeah, I won't go into too much detail, but I did something very rude. You can't really see because I'm, I was backlit, so I'm all in shadow, but I did something quite rude with the Hoover while I was singing, and I emailed that. Only 90% sure that it was a joke. <laughs> And yeah, and so that went off to this fake email address that Rob had, and he was in an office with the producers and the directors and the cast and everyone all at the same time. They went, Jack's video has come through, it's his video, he's going to sing Ronan Keating. Clicked on it, 
and then that's what they saw. And you literally, you could hear screaming coming out of Chepstow. I was like, thank God, because if that wasn't a prank, I don't know how I'd tell my dad why the BBC fired me. <laughs> There's nothing like that, I'm really sorry I did something disgusting to a boomer. But yeah, that was the worst prank. And I think Rob is the only one still with that video on his phone. So, oh, God forbid iClouds get hacked again. <laughs> yeah. Um, and next question that in series three, someone would have known. I had a whole storyline in my head that he should have a brother, um, which I can't tell you how that storyline would have worked. It wouldn't have been Pacify's son, it would have been his father's son having come back. And it, it, me and my brother talked about it, and he could have been Achilles, it would have been great. But, um, but the idea would be that someone in series three would say, you're, you're kidding yourself, you think this is it. This isn't you, this is a dream world. You're from the modern world, you may have been born here, but you're just playing it being a game. And that starts to freak Jason out a bit. Yeah. Um, but originally they shot, sorry, I'm giving really long answers here. <laughs> originally, and I was really sad this went, they shot a whole different beginning to Atlantis and it had to get cut because the episode was going too long. But the whole thing started in the modern world in a little boy's room and you saw like posters and stuff up on the wall of like, um, Hercules and like all sorts of stuff from Greek mythology and toys on a windowsill and it was at night time and there was rain like hitting against the window and just th th through the window you could sort of make out that there was like a blue flashing light going outside and like a little seven year old boy just got up and he walks out onto the landing in his house and he can hear voices downstairs and the front doors open and he goes downstairs and just as the kitchen door creeps open you see two police officers talking to his godparents saying uh, I say it's been two weeks, they're calling off the search. And they say, is there, is there nothing you can do? They said, you know, they don't know where else to look, they can't keep going, that, that's it. They go, well, should we wake Jason up? Should we tell him? And then they hear a noise and they look around and you see seven-year-old Jason there. And it's his godfather who was on the ship with says, Jason, listen, he says, I, I know what you're going to say. So they can't find my, my dad. And no one really says anything. And he says, it's all right. He said, you were never supposed to find him. I know. Um, and it's all the lines that I said in the episode anyway. And I said, what do you mean? He said, he told me he wasn't coming back. He gave me this. It's fine. And then he just walks back off upstairs. And that sort of freaks out the police and his godparents. And then the next scene you see, it cuts to him, you know, 15 years later. And he's on the boat with his godfather. And then all that dialogue that was in that scene originally wasn't there. It was just his godfather saying, is there any way I can talk you out of this? He says, you can try, but it's not going to work. Uh, and then that's it, and then he goes down. And I really like that scene, because it gave you the idea that you saw that Jason's dad had lived with him, you saw him as a little boy growing up in that world, and the fact that his dad had said goodnight to him one day and said, you know, not now, but one day, and that Jason was fine with that. But then 15 years goes by and there's nothing. But the episode ran so long that they had to cut that scene and add in all the dialogue into my scene on the boat, which made it really weird to have like a 25 year old being like, he gay? And also, I thought that scene should be played really quietly and intimately, but it was so windy on that boat, and I couldn't really hear what the other actor was saying, so I'm there going, he gave me this! He didn't, he, it doesn't make, he, he was never coming back, I'll tell you later! So yeah, I was never quite happy with the way that scene went out, I way preferred the scene with the little boy, but there you go. I can't even remember what your question was. <laughs> try and sort out the mess that he'd left, but Pacify had become too strong and he had to go on the run and that's when he becomes a leper and he then lives out in the leper colony. That's what's happened. I believe in the time from when he had to go on the run from Pacify before he becomes a leper, if he's traveling from town to town, if he had a relationship with someone else, with another woman, and that they had a child, but he was on the run, he didn't know he had a child. If that woman had a son, that son, in essence would be Jason's half-brother on his father's side. So this is the story I wanted to write. So if she had a son, that woman would obviously never tell the boy that his father was once a king because that would put him in danger to pacify, that would, you know, so she'd keep that boy's um, life a secret, he wouldn't know. But also as a double measure to protect him, I feel that that mum should have dipped her son in the river Styx by his ankle, thus making him Achilles. Um, and I believe that if Jason, when he came back in series three, was to go on, you know, the Argonaut story, he's going around from town to town before he comes back to Atlantis, if by chance he met this boy and they seemed very similar and they didn't know why, it would only be this child's mother that would know when she finds out who he is and he's the son of Pacify and stuff, would put, connect the dots and say, 
this is my son's brother, this is also the king's other child, and Jason and Achilles would be brothers. Um, and I think that that would be the first person that Jason would properly open up to, because all he wants is family. You know, he hasn't got it with his father, he can't trust his mother, that's his quest. If he found out he had a brother, I think that would be the person that he would tell about coming from the modern world and how we grew up and he'd share that story. And then also, Achilles was an Argonaut, so um, that would help. Unfortunately, there's no series three, but I think that would have been excellent. <laughs> there's a film in that though, isn't there? There is a film in that, yeah. Oh man, I'm, oh yeah, I love that one. I was like, I've gone through two years of this show trying to do it all naturally. And then he shaded it in with dirt, like one shot. And I was like, this is the best I've ever looked. <laughs> Sit-ups the whole time, you can just draw it on. Yeah, so there's one if there's one shot we think, God, he looks really ripped. It's not real. <laughs> it's dirt and olive oil. <laughs> uh, yes. Any um just wondered, where did you prefer to film, like Forest of Dean or Morocco? Oh Morocco, hands down by a million miles. Forest of Dean is cool, and sometimes it's nice to get out of the studio. When you're in the studio for a few days, you think, okay, it's a day in the forest. But once you've done like two or three days in the forest, you start to get bored and it gets cold and you get bitten by bugs and stuff. Um, and everything just takes longer in the forest because you've got camera crews trying to get up over muddy banks and stuff. To be fair, I don't know how Merlin did it because there are some days when it's raining and they just tried to hide the rain. But Merlin obviously could do that because it's England. So uh, God, the stuff that I heard that Colin and Bradley were put through, literally dying of hypothermia in the mud, <laughs> filming in the forest. Uh, whereas for us, when we were in Morocco, I, I loved the sun. So yeah, I way preferred that. Yeah, much better out there. Plus there's a pool. <laughs> and knives. And we played with it all the time. To an extent that I think any little boy would. And then when I finally, when I met the producers, when I first got the part, and they called me in for a meeting to show me some of the stuff that we'd be doing, um, and they asked me about that, I said, oh, just so you know, I'm, I'm a really good sword fighter. And they went, oh, why? Did you do like stage combat at drama school? I was like, uh, well, yes, but no, that's not what I mean. I mean, I used to sword fight all the time when I was younger. And there was that awkward moment when I thought what I was saying sounded really cool. And they're going, how do you mean? I was like, when I was a little boy, me and my brothers, Play with swords all the time, I'm very, very good. And they were just looking at me thinking, we've hired an idiot, <laughs> which they still think. But, to be fair, I will stand up. It took me a long time to learn what it's like to be on camera and to do all that sort of stuff. But I think the fact that my mum's a dancer and I did so much dancing growing up really helped with the sword fighting. It sounds like a ridiculous thing, but it made it so much easier to pick up. And actually, all that playing when I was younger did help. It, it, there's no different doing it when you're acting to when you're doing it as a kid. So the combination of the two just made it easier. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it a lot more. Next question. I've got one more scene, I can handle it. No one's gonna stab me, and that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Some person had the knife, they went like that, and I had to knock their arm out of the way, and then flip them over my shoulder. But I think because they were nervous that they had the knife, they went like that and sort of stalled with it. So I went like that to do the move, put my arm out, and then they pushed, and it went straight through my elbow out the other side. Um, and I was like, oh God, carried on. It missed every bone, every artery, everything. It was just a clean cut through like my elbow fat. <laughs> um, but yeah, it didn't really hurt. That was fine. Got sent off to A&E, got glued up, um, had a bandage put around it. That was on a Friday night. It was about filming on Monday. Um, this one, the day you were there for, that was two weeks before the end of filming. I got a sword to the eye. Um, again, that wasn't too bad. And even spraining my ankle wasn't that bad. Uh, it just meant that we had to reschedule some of the fights. The worst stuff, by far, and Ollie Walker and Clive Stanton can um, get this, was the fighting in the arena, definitely. Of which there is more to come in this series. There's, um, I won't say too much, there's a fight that Jason has to go into that he already, before he goes into the arena, has to be half dead to give the other guys the advantage. He goes in without a weapon against two guys with a weapon. And I won't say how that's come out, but I did the, the arena where we fought, when we first did it, we didn't think to put mats under the sand. And it's concrete, the floor in there, so it's just sand on top of concrete. Um, and I was asking questions about fight, the very first move of the very first fight on day one, and we were doing this for five days, um, was a guy picked me up like that with my legs up in the air, and then he slammed me down like that onto my back, and I just went <laughs> against the concrete, and instantly you felt it go all the way up your spine, and I was like, that's 
take one, and we, I had to do nine fights and think every fight, because of the way we were filming, took about 20 to 30 takes. So after a week of that, I remember they sent me to physio, and the physio wouldn't massage me because of the bruises all up and down my body. They're like, no, you, you're bruised way too bad. This isn't, this isn't gonna help. So that, that was really rough doing those fights and being on that many painkillers. Um, I was gonna say something else about that as well. Um, oh, and yeah, and then the worst thing was, we, that was series one, did all those fights, did it all like that, sent it to the BBC, and they went, no, that's way too violent for what we're showing. They cut it all. Yeah, so you never see any of the impact. They're like, we can't show any of the impact, we can't show the actual pain, because it's too violent for a Saturday night at that time slot. So all the worst stuff that you ever see me go through um, never made it into the episode, but they got much better at filming the fights as, as it went on, so that by the end we got it concise, we could do it in 20 takes, I knew which ones I could hold back on and which ones I really had to go for it. But still, you'd just be shattered after a week of that. And that was always when Mark got his holiday to Italy. <laughs> it was all because of scheduling. Excellent. Well, we have run out of time. Uh, and then this came along, and to be fair, I didn't even know how big it was at the beginning. For some reason, I didn't get sent all the information. All I had was the title. I didn't even know it was BBC. And then as the audition process went on, um, I realized it was the same producers that had done Merlin. I realized it was Saturday night. Um, and it just got <laughs> even more and more daunting um, as the process continued. Um, but the horse riding, the fighting, the fact it filmed in Morocco, that it's, you know, fantasy drama, all that stuff is what I grew up on. So. It, it ticked every box for me as an actor. I was like, this is way better than an episode of Doctors. Um, so yeah, everything. Running away from the hunting lions, which I wish they brought back, to be fair. I thought that was a great idea, and it never came up in another episode. Um, when I jump and grab onto the, onto the pole and swing up and do the flip, we did that, and on the very first day, they said, you know what you're doing, you jump, you grab, you swing. I was like, yeah, it's good, off the trampet, and I missed the pole by about, <laughs> two clear feet, and so I don't, boom, straight onto the ground. Um, and yeah, and that was it. And no one did anything except laugh. And the first idea was like, when you're done being a little girl, do you want to go again? And I was like, oh God, oh God. Um, oh, and also, um, even though I wasn't technically filming, uh, when I sprained my ankle and had to go to A&E in the second series, I'd just done a massive fight scene, that was all fine, and then I was running to go wee behind a tree. <laughs> and that's when I sprained my ankle. And after 20 minutes medical attention with everyone around me, someone went, wait, hang on, do you still need the loo? I was like, yeah, can you all turn around? <laughs> so I had the director and everyone like blocking me with their backs while I just stood on one leg trying to not pee on myself. I don't know why I tell these stories. <laughs> yeah, I would have Atlantis series three. <laughs> No, um, no, good question. You know what? It changes a lot. Right now, I'm massively into Vikings, um, <laughs> which is brilliant. Because um, Clive Standen was in series two, who plays Rollo in the Vikings. I had nothing to do. I was like, you yeah, know, I'll check Vikings out. I love it. I think it's brilliant. I can't be in it because not only do I look nothing like a Viking, I'm five foot ten and they're all about six foot four in that show. Um, but for me, comedy is my thing. I started in comedy and. I would like to go back to it. Um, I don't know if there is any perfect role out there. Um, I'm thinking about that actually. Yeah, my brother is a writer and he's just written something, and, but then he's really good at that. I, <laughs> I don't know what I would write. But in terms to be in comedy, in terms of what I like watching, I tend to gravitate towards the fantasy drama, Game of Thrones, Vikings, you know, that, that's what's up my street, which is why Atlantis was so good. So if I could do a funny Game of Thrones <laughs> plebs, <laughs> there you go.